Hello, I'm Michael LaCroix from Mission Health in Asheville, North Carolina, and I will be delivering the second orthopedic trauma lecture, beginning with acetabular fractures and extending to conclude with the distal portion of the lower extremity. This is my pertinent disclosure. Acetabular fractures are characteristically evaluated radiographically with AP, iliac oblique, and obturator oblique images, and there are several different radiographic landmarks that are critical for classifying and characterizing these fractures. The first is the iliopectineal line, which is the radiographic landmark for the anterior column of the acetabulum. Next is the ilioischial line, which is the radiographic landmark for the posterior column. The teardrop is not an actual anatomical structure, but a radiographic density, which is useful for evaluating the possibility of protrusio, the femoral head, medially. The weight-bearing dome extends over an approximately 45-degree arc and is the critical portion for evaluating displacement of the acetabular fractures. And then five is the anterior wall, and six is the posterior wall, remembering that due to the antiversion of the acetabulum on a standard AP projection, the posterior wall will project more laterally than the anterior wall. The Lotronel classification system for acetabular fractures is important as it does have both therapeutic and prognostic significance. It's divided into five simple or elementary fractures and five combination or associated fractures. The elementary fractures include the posterior wall fracture, which is the most common type of all acetabular fractures, the posterior column fracture, the anterior wall fracture, which is quite rare, the anterior column fracture, and then the transverse or transtectal fracture, which has the hallmark of involving both the anterior and the posterior columns of the acetabulum. The five combination or associated fractures include posterior column with a posterior wall, transverse with a posterior wall, which is the most common of the combination fractures, and then there's the T-type fracture, which has the hallmark of a vertical fracture line extending typically into the obturator ring Significance of this is that the posterior and anterior columns are now dissociated from one another, meaning that a anterior or posterior approach is not usually sufficient to repair these fractures. The T-type fracture in all published series has the worst prognosis, primarily due to the dissociation of the two columns relative to one another. Then there is the anterior with the posterior hemitransverse, which is a somewhat difficult translation from the French, but can be thought of as a transverse with an anterior wall or an anterior column, quite rare type. And then there's the both columns fracture, or the so-called floating acetabular fracture, where all portions of the acetabular articular surface are no longer connected to the axial skeleton. The both columns fracture deserves some special mention because it does have a pathognomonic radiographic finding, which is this so-called spur sign. It's seen on the obturator oblique image, and the arrow there is pointing towards the spur, and what that represents is the most distal or stable portion of the iliac wing. This radiograph also demonstrates a feature unique to both columns fractures, which is the phenomenon of secondary congruence. In this situation, the acetabular articular surfaces are significantly displaced relative to the intact portion of the ilium. However, the anterior and posterior columns are relatively minimally dissociated from one another, and this would be the type of fracture that would be amenable potentially to non-operative treatment for that reason. Non-operative treatment of acetabular fractures is appropriate for non-displaced or minimally displaced fractures defined as less than two millimeters of displacement of the weight-bearing dome of the acetabulum, or for displaced fractures in which the weight-bearing dome is found to be intact. The integrity of the weight-bearing dome can be assessed radiographically using roof arcs, which is where a line is drawn from the center of the femoral head parallel to the long axis of the skeleton, and a second line is drawn to where the fracture exits. And on this obturator oblique image here, the roof arc measures 66 degrees. If the roof, arc, roof arcs are greater than 45 degrees on the AP inlet and uh, excuse me, obturate oblique and iliac oblique images, then that would, the weight-bearing dome should be considered to be intact, and that fracture would be appropriate for non-operative management. Also, the femoral head must remain congruent with the intact portion of the acetabulum on x-rays taken with the patient out of traction. Small posterior wall fractures involving less than 20% of the posterior wall are also usually appropriate for non-operative management, and then there's the ph phenomenon of secondary congruence in both columns fractures, which I just discussed. Non-operative treatment typically consists of protected weight bearing for a period of eight to 10 weeks, as well as close radiographic follow-up to, to make sure that the weight bearing dome does not become displaced. And if you have to keep the patient in traction 
to maintain a congruent reduction of the acetabulum, that patient should be considered for operative intervention. Surgical indications for acetabular fractures including, include displacement of the weight-bearing dome greater than two millimeters, large posterior wall fractures involving greater than 40% of the posterior wall, or posterior wall fractures that have dynamic joint instability by fluoroscopic stress examination. This requires often putting the patient under anesthesia and examination in the operating room under uh, dynamic fluoric, fluoros fluoroscopic stress examination. Marginal impaction, which is typically only seen by CT scan, is another indication as is demonstrated on the lower right image. Any loose bodies within the joint, which can lead to a non-congruent reduction, as well as irreducible fracture dislocations would obviously be an indication for operative intervention. The surgical approaches for acetabular fractures, the workhorse approach uh, for posterior fracture patterns is the co posterolateral cochlear langenbach approach. The ilioinguinal approach is the traditional uh, pr approach for anterior approach to the acetabulum, more recently being replaced by the modified stopper approach in, uh, in many surgeons' hands. There are also the extensile approaches, such as the triradiate and extended iliofemoral, and then there are certain fracture patterns, most commonly the T-type fracture, which may require a combined approach with separate approaches for the posterior and anterior aspects of the acetabulum. All of the surgical approaches uh, had their own inherent risks and disadvantages. The posterior approach has the significant risk of iatrogenic injury to the sciatic nerve, which in, even in the most experienced hands is never zero. In the literature, it varies anywhere from 2 to 10 percent. There's also the potential for damage to the femoral head blood supply with injury to the medial femoral circumflex artery. The anterior approach to the acetabulum has the risks of femoral nerve injury as well as injury to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve thrombosis of the femoral vessels, or laceration of the corona mortis. Talk more about the corona mortis in a moment, but it is an anastomosis between the external iliac vessels and the obturator artery. Then the extended iliofemoral approach has a significant risk of heterotopic ossification. That approach involves essentially skeletonizing the ileum with release of the uh, iliopsoas muscle from the internal iliac fossa and release of the abductors from the external iliac fossa, hence the significant risk of heterotopic ossification as well as the possibility of posterior gluteal muscle necrosis. The corona mortis again is at risk with all anterior approaches, the alioinguinal as well as the stopper approach. Again, it's a retropubic vascular connection between the external iliac vessels and the obturator artery. It's said to be present anywhere between 10 to 30 percent of all patients as part of their normal anatomy, and is typically found three centimeters lateral to the pubic symphysis. Complications of acetabular fractures, post-traumatic arthrosis is by far the most common complication. Heterotopic ossification, as we mentioned, is much more common with the extensile approaches and also with the cochlear langenbach posterolateral approach. Prophylaxis for HO is either indocin or radiation therapy. Both have been found shown to be equally effective. Thromboembolic complications are significant with these injuries, and if a patient is diagnosed preoperatively with a thromboembolic thromboembolic complication, they should be treated with an IVC filter preoperatively, and then there is the risk of atrogenic neurologic injury anywhere from 2 to 15 percent, uh, as we discussed. Outcomes of acetabular fractures, it's show, the literature does clearly support that the clinical outcome of the patient is directly correlated to the quality of the articular reduction. So anatomic reduction of the weight-bearing dome of the acetabulum is clearly associated with improved clinical results. Other factors associated with improved outcomes include early surgery defined as less than 10 to 14 days post-injury, the absence of damage to the femoral head, uh, chondral injury to the femoral head, as well as the absence of comminution of the fracture. And you should be aware in the literature that there is a disproportionate incidence of quite poor outcomes in posterior wall fractures. And this is believed to be due to the fact that many of these fractures are quite comminuted, associated with marginal impaction of the posterior wall, as well as the possibility of sheer chondral injury to the femoral head. Moving on to hip dislocations, posterior dislocations are much more common than anterior because of the mechanism of injury. Ipsilateral injuries to the knee are quite common in association with hip dislocations. The treatment of a hip dislocation is an emergent close reduction and then a clinical assessment of the stability of the hip post-reduction. Also, a post-reduction CT scan is indicated for all traumatic hip dislocations to look for the following intracapsular injuries, and those are the presence of a femoral head fracture, possible intraarticular loose bodies, which could lead to a non-congruent reduction, 
as well as the possibility of an associated acetabular fracture. Stable hip joints without associated injuries can be treated post-reduction with assisted weight bearing for several weeks. Complications of hip dislocations, again, post-traumatic arthrosis is the most common complication. Osteonecrosis of the femoral head occurs in about 10 to 15 percent of all hip dislocations, and sciatic nerve injury is seen in about 10 to 20 percent of all posterior hip dislocations. Femoral head fractures are seen almost exclusively in association with posterior hip dislocations, and post-reduction, any displacement of the femoral head fragment is an indication for surgery. The surgical approaches to address femoral head fractures include the anterior Smith-Peterson approach, utilizing the internervous plane between the superior gluteal and femoral nerves, um, as well as the transtrochanteric approach, osteotomizing the trochanter, which is useful for treatment of Pipkin IV fractures. Pipkin I fractures are where you have a small femoral head fragment below the level of the fovea. If that fragment is non-displaced post-reduction to the hip, it, the patient can be treated with protected weight bearing for a period of four to six weeks. If the fragment is displaced and or comminuted, then excision is typically indicated. Pipkin II fractures are larger femoral head fractures that extend above the level of the fovea. Those are treated with open reduction and internal fixation, typically using titanium countersunk screws uh, to allow for the possibility of post-operative MRI to assess the viability of the femoral head. Pipkin III fractures have the worst prognosis and fortunately are also, are also the, the most infrequent of the Pipkin injuries. That's a, a Pipkin I or II in association with a femoral neck fracture. Uh, if the patient is young and functional, the patient should be treated with open reduction internal fixation of both the head and neck fractures. In an older patient, prosthetic replacement of the proximal femur would be appropriate. And then finally, the Pipkin IV fracture is a Pipkin I or II femoral head fracture in association with a posterior wall tabular fracture. The treatment of these injuries is to either fix or excise the femoral head fragment and then repair the posterior wall fracture. Again, this is the ideal indication for the transtrochanteric approach. Moving on now to femoral neck fractures, there is an increasing prevalence of femoral neck fractures uh, in North America, particularly in Caucasian women. If the patient is suspected to have a femoral neck fracture but plain radiographs are negative, MRI, a T1-weighted image, is the diagnostic imaging modality of choice. And then important to remember that the physiologic age of the patient as well as the presence or absence of displacement of the fracture are the most important factors in determining the treatment of femoral neck fractures as well as the risk of complications. Surgery is indicated for almost all femoral neck fractures. Non-operative treatment is typically reserved for only the truly non-ambulatory patient with prohibited medical comorbidities. We feel that even non-displaced fractures should be fixed to prevent displacement. The timing of fixation is important. Improved outcomes have clearly been demonstrated in the literature with surgery within 48 hours of admission. And then the treatment recommendations are based on the presence or absence of displacement of the fracture as well as the physiologic age of the patient. This treatment algorithm is very helpful. Uh, the first important thing to determine is whether the fracture is displaced or non-displaced. If the fracture is non-displaced or valgus impacted, then typically internal fixation with cannulated screws is the preferred treatment. If the fracture is displaced and the patient is felt to be physiologically young, then a closed reduction of the femoral neck can be attempted. If an anatomical reduction of the femoral neck cannot be obtained, then an open reduction is indicated, and then fixation with cannulated screws is performed. If the patient has a displaced fracture and is physiologically old, then prosthetic replacement of the proximal femur is the preferred treatment of choice, either with a hemiarthroplasty or if the patient is young, active, or is known to have pre-existing hip disease with a total hip arthroplasty. Internal fixation of femoral neck fractures is typically performed with parallel cancellous screws placed at or above the level of the lesser trochanter. Avoid going below the level lesser trochanter to prevent creating a significant stress riser. And a three screw configuration typically is appropriate for most fractures in the so-called inverted triangle configuration. If there is significant posterior comminution, a fourth screw can be added. And in osteoporotic bone, which is essentially all geriatric uh, femoral neck fractures, improved fixation has been demonstrated with screws placed adjacent to the femoral cortex, uh, the, the, the neck of the femur posteriorly and inferiorly. So that post inferior calcar screw as well as a screw posterior adjacent to the posterior cortex of the femoral neck. Uh, 
in the inverted triangle configuration. If there's a basis cervical fracture, a sliding hip screw with a derotation screw would be an appropriate treatment. Prosthetic replacement of femoral neck fractures, a couple of things to note are that the literature clearly supports that the results of cemented hemiarthroplasty are greater than the results of uncemented hemiarthroplasty. The issue of unipolar versus bipolar hemiarthroplasty remains somewhat controversial. The literature at this time does not support any advantage to use of a bipolar implant. The outcomes are essentially similar between those two modalities. You can perform a hemiarthroplasty through a posterior approach or an anterolateral approach. They both have their own associated uh, risks. With the posterior approach, there's an increased risk of prosthetic dislocation, whereas with the anterolateral approach, there's a significant uh, risk of abductor weakness. And again, if the patient is known to have pre-existing hip disease or the patient is active and el active elderly patient, the, then total hip arthroplasty as opposed to hemiarthroplasty has been associated with significantly improved long-term functional outcomes. In young patients, a displaced femoral neck fracture should be considered to be a surgical emergency. It's critical to reduce the femoral neck as soon as possible to restore blood flow to the, to the head of the femur. Uh, anatomical reduction of the fracture is essential. If an anatomical reduction cannot be obtained using closed techniques, then an open reduction is indicated, which can be performed through an anterolateral Watson-Jones approach or occasionally through an anterior Smith-Peterson approach. Internal fixation is then performed with parallel Kinsella screws. An anterior capsulotomy can be performed as well to decompress the capsule. And you should be aware that the literature does show that in young patients with displaced femoral neck fractures, there is a significantly increased risk of both osteonecrosis as well as fracture nonunion. In older patients, non-displaced fractures can be treated with parallel Kinsella screws. With displaced fractures, the issue of internal fixation versus prosthetic replacement is somewhat controversial. There is significantly decreased perioperative morbidity, decreased blood loss, decreased time to surgery, et cetera, associated with internal fixation. However, there's also a significantly increased risk of secondary surgery. If the patient is truly debilitated, then hemiarthroplasty is usually appropriate. If a patient develops a non-union of a femoral neck fracture and the MRI will show that the femoral head remains viable, then the valgus a Powell's valgus intertrochanteric osteotomy is the treatment of choice. Basically, the osteotomy converts the shear forces across the femoral neck non-union into compressive forces, harnessing the physiologic forces across the hip joint to obtain uh, compression across the non-union site, and it's been shown to be a very effective technique for treatment of a varus non-union. Intertrochanteric femur fractures now, moving down to the extracapsular portion of the proximal femur. Surgical stabilization is indicated in all previously ambulatory patients. Early surgery within 48 hours has been associated with decreased one-year mortality, so it is important to get these patients to the operating room as soon as possible. It's also important to remember that anatomical reduction of the intermediate fragments, such as the displaced lesser trochanteric fragment indicated here, is not necessary, nor is medial displacement osteotomy of the femoral shaft uh, helpful in these treatment of these fractures. The surgical treatment for intertroche fractures, the sliding hip compression screw and side plate remains the preferred implant for stable fracture patterns. This implant allows you to obtain dynamic interfragmentary compression by the sliding of the lag screw within the barrel of the side plate. For positioning of the proximal lag screw, remember that the center, center position of the screw is best. Center the femoral head on the AP image, center the femoral head on the lateral image, and the screw head should be placed close to the subchondral bone. The tip to apex distance should be less than 25 millimeters. The tip to apex distance is defined as the distance between the tip of the screw and the center of the femoral head on both the AP and lateral images. If that tip to apex distance is less than 25 millimeters, then the risk of screw cutout is essentially zero. The problem with the sliding hip compression screw and side plate uh, construct is that with unstable fracture patterns, it can lead to significant medial displacement of the femoral shaft. And you should also be aware that the integrity of the lateral femoral cortex in intertrochanteric fractures is a significant predictor of reoperation.
Treatment of uh, intertrochal fractures with uh, uh, hip screw is cephalomedullary fixation. It has the advantage in unstable fracture patterns that this construct will resist ex excessive fracture collapse and medialization of the shaft, which can occur with a sliding compression screw and side plate. It also can be inserted through a smaller incision, so-called percutaneous technique, which theoretically can lead to faster rehabilitation of the patient. There is the risk of fracture of the femoral shaft at the tip of the implant. Uh, if you use a short nail, you can avoid by using long nails. However, long nails can also lead to uh, anterior cortical penetration in the distal aspect of the femur due to the mismatch of the bow of the nail and the bow of the femur. The bottom line is that with hip screws, the literature does not support uh, that the routine use of these implants for stable two-part fractures. So again, for stable two-part fractures, the preferred implant of choice is the sliding hip compression screw and side plate. Now the reverse obliquity fracture is a, is a special intertrochanteric fracture that deserves uh, mention. Um, with this fracture pattern, a sliding hip compression screw and side plate is contraindicated. A cephalomedullary device would be the implant of choice. Alternately, a 95 degree fixed angle device such as a blade plate or dynamic condylar screw can be used as well as possibly a proximal femoral locking plate. Moving on now to talk about subtrochanteric femur fractures. Uh, the subtrochanteric region of the proximal femur is a, is, has a lot of biomechanical stresses in that area with multiple muscles with long lever arms acting at that, this portion of the femur. The proximal fragment typically is flexed and abducted, whereas the femoral shaft fragment is typically internally rotated and adducted. Um, consequently, there's, with traditional implants, there's a high risk of implant failure before fracture union. You also can see atypical fractures uh, in this portion of the proximal femur with patients on bisphosphonate therapy. If the piriformis fossa is intact, then intramedullary fixation is the preferred treatment for subtroch fractures. If the piriformis fossa and the greater, troch are, greater trochanter are involved in the fracture, then extramedullary plate fixation may be appropriate. So cephalomedullary fixation of subtroke fractures is the, again, the treatment of choice for most subtroke fractures. It preserves the vascularity of the bone. It also allows you to place a load sharing implant, and it has been shown to be a significantly stronger construct in unstable fracture patterns. However, this technique is associated with a risk of varus and flexion malreduction. It's important to remember that when you insert the nail, it will not reduce the fracture. So the fracture has to be reduced once the, before the nail is placed. And again, this is the preferred treatment if the piriformis fossa and greater trochanter are intact. Moving on now to talk about femoral shaft fractures. The timing of stabilization of femoral shaft fractures remains important. Early stabilization of a femoral shaft fracture defined as within the first 24 hours has been associated with decreased risk of pulmonary complications, decreased risk of thromboembolic complications, faster rehabilitation of the patient, as well as decreased cost of the overall hospitalization. The one caveat to this is that you do need to be careful in the patient with a severe closed head injury, where taking the patient to the operating room early and doing a femoral nailing can be associated with worsening of the patient's closed head injury in the association of intraoperative hypotension or hypoxemia. Intramedullary nailing uh, is the treatment of choice for femoral shaft fractures. A statically locked ream nail is the standard of care for the treatment of femoral shaft fractures. Union rates are very high and complications are rare. The type of nail and the type of technique used, whether it's anti-grade, trochanteric entry, or retrograde, is based on surgeon preference as well as the fracture pattern. With intramedullary nailing of femoral shaft fractures, the results of ream nailing are greater than the results of unream nailing, specifically with a higher union rate. Beware the patient that has bilateral femoral shaft fractures. There's significantly increased risk of pulmonary complications, as well as 7% mortality reported in that patient population. And then once a femoral nail has been placed, and if it's statically locked, immediate weight bearing is appropriate, even for significantly comminuted femoral shaft fractures. Trochanteric entry um, has come into favor quite recently, and the results of trochanteric entry femoral nailing have been nearly equivalent to those reported for piriformis fossa entry. The nail is inserted through the greater trochanter. There is a risk of varus malalignment, as well as a risk of iatrogenic comminution with use of these, uh, this technique. Um, this is somewhat ameliorated by the lateral bend of the trochanteric nails, but the proper starting point remains important and the proper starting point for trochanteric nailing is just lateral to the long axis of the femur, which may or may not be the tip of the trochanter.
Retrograde nailing of femoral shaft fractures has been associated with improved alignment in distal third fractures. It is typically associated with decreased surgical time and blood loss. When you're using this technique, it's important to remember that the nail must be countersunk, leaving the nail even one millimeter proud has devastating consequences for the patellofemoral joint. Also, two distal locking screws are recommended with all retrograde femoral nails. Other current accepted indications for retrograde nailing include, in addition to distal third fractures, the morbidly obese patients, the floating knee injury with ipsilateral injuries, uh, ipsilateral femoral shaft and tibial shaft fractures, bilateral femur fractures for ease of positioning of the patient, the ipsilateral femoral neck femoral shaft fracture is an ideal indication, as well as the patient that has an ipsilateral acetabular fracture where you want to avoid making any surgical incisions proximally that could compromise your later approach for fixation of the acetabular fracture. External fixation is important uh, with femoral shaft fractures and it's typically indicated uh, with damage control techniques in the unstable polytrauma patient. Also may be indicated with severe open fractures or patients with associated vascular injuries. If an external fixator is going to be considered for definitive treatment of femoral shaft fractures, pin track problems are very frequent as well as stiffness with binding of the quadriceps. Um, when an external fixator is used uh, in a damage control situation, it can be safely converted to an intramedullary nail anytime within the first two to three weeks, as long as the patient does not have any evidence of pin tract infection. Open femoral shaft fractures require emergent surgical debridement. Uh, then they can be treated as closed fractures are treated with immediate ream diam nailing, and the results are comparable to what we see for closed fractures. Gunshot femur fractures, if it's a low velocity handgun type injury, local wound debridement is performed followed by reamed nailing as we would do for a closed fracture. If it's a higher velocity gunshot fracture, then aggressive soft tissue debridement typically is required and the fixation option there would be either external fixation or an unreamed nail as dictated by the soft tissue injury. The ipsilateral neck shaft fracture is important to mention. Uh, it, the neck fracture is missed in the literature approximately one third of the time. If you see a patient with a comminuted mid shaft fracture, you need to think about the possibility of an associated femoral neck fracture and rule that out. The femoral neck fractures are usually basis cervical and vertically oriented. A fine cut CT scan is the best imaging modality for preoperative diagnosis intraoperatively multiple fluoroscopic views of the hip are appropriate. Once the neck fracture has been recognized, it is given priority in the treatment. The patient needs to undergo uh, a closed versus open anatomical reduction with screw fixation of the femoral neck fracture and then either retrograde nailing or plate fixation of the shaft fracture. Moving on now to talk about distal femur fractures. Non-operative treatment of, is appropriate for non-displaced extraarticular fractures of the distal femur. Also, for patients that are non-ambulatory or have prohibited medical comorbidities, the technique is to use a long leg brace, uh, non-weight bearing for approximately six weeks, a uh, hinge brace to allow the patient to begin range of motion to the knee immediately. Surgical treatment for distal femur fractures, the principle is to reduce the articular surface of surfaces of the distal femur initially and then use an implant, uh, whether it's a nail or a, or a plate, to stabilize the articular segment of the bone to the shaft. When plate fixation of complete articular distal femur fractures is being performed, you should avoid non-fixed angle plating due to the significant risk of varus malalignment. So fixed angle plating has been shown to be very useful in distal femur fractures, those that have significant metaphyseal comminution. They allow you to do direct or indirect reduction of the fracture. If you're going to use a blade plate, then you need two centimeters of intact bone distally. If you're going to use a condo or screw, you need four centimeters of, in, of intact bone distally. And you should be aware that these types of fixed angle plates are contraindicated in distal femur fractures that have an associated coronal plane fracture, the so-called Hoffa fragment. The Hoffa fragment is a vertically oriented fracture in the coronal plane and it's seen in about 38% of all intraarticular fractures of the distal femur, typically involving the lateral femoral condyle. Retrograde nailing of distal femur fractures is appropriate for supracondylar fractures, the 33A fractures without significant comminution. It's also useful for treatment of periprosthetic fractures of the distal femur in situations where the posterior cruciate ligament has been spared. However, compared with plate fixation, this technique does have less axial and less rotational stability. There's also an increased incidence of knee pain. If you're going to use a retrograde nail for treatment of a distal femur fracture, you should use a long nail with locking 
at or above the level of the lesser trochanter proximally. Now, lock plating allows the use of anatomically contoured implants to create a fixed angle construct. The plates can be inserted through smaller incisions with a percutaneous or submuscular insertion technique, often using targeting devices for fixation into the femoral shaft more proximally. Again, it's very useful in patients that have osteoporotic bone or significant metaphyseal comminution, and this has become the treatment of choice for periprosthetic fractures of the distal femur. When you're using this technique, you should use a construct with a long working length. In other words, use longer plates to create flexible but stable fixation. In addition to using longer plates, you should use non-locking screws in the femoral shaft fracture segment. There is an increased risk of malreduction compared with conventional open plating using this technique, however. Risk factors for reoperation with distal femur fractures include open fractures, patients that have diabetes or smokers, increased BMI, and use of shorter plates. Lock plating typically is performed. Uh, the implants that are available uh, today typically allow for so-called hybrid locked plating, which is where you can use both locked and non-locking screws in the same fixation construct. The non-locking screws are helpful in that they allow you to use the plate itself as a reduction tool. In other words, you can essentially pull the bone to the plate, whereas the locking screws provide a fixed angle fixation and resist fracture collapse. When you're using this type of hybrid fixation technique, you need to remember that the non-locking screws must be inserted into each, into each fragment before locking screws are placed. Knee dislocations are typically very high energy associated with significant soft tissue disruption. Remember that knee dislocations are probably underdiagnosed as they may actually present with the knee being reduced and vascular injuries are quite common with knee dislocations. Up to 50% of all knee dislocations will have a significant vascular injury which can present in a delayed fashion. Neurologic injury is also quite prominent. The perineal nerve can be injured about 25% of the time, particularly with lateral dislocations, and associated fractures of the ipsilateral extremity are seen in about 60% of cases. Now, vascular injury, the hard signs of vascular injury include absent pulses, bleeding, expanding hematoma, the presence of a bruit or a thrill. The soft signs, which are somewhat more difficult to diagnose, include diminished pulses, decreased capillary refill, hypesthesia of the extremity, or decreased temperature of the leg. Remember that the normal ankle brachial index, which can be always obtained by Doppler evaluation, should be greater than 0.9. If the ABI is less than 0.9, the patient needs to be further evaluated for possible vascular injury. If hard signs are present, once the knee has been reduced, then a preoperative arteriogram does not, is, or preoperative vascular study is not necessary. That patient should be taken to the operating room emergently for vascular exploration and repair. If the patient has soft signs, however, post-reduction, then additional radiographic workup is indicated. When a patient has a significant vascular injury, the limb needs to be revascularized within eight hours, typically using reverse saphenous vein graft. And don't forget about the uh, need for fasciotomies, particularly if the warm ischemia has been present for more than six hours due to the phenomenon of reperfusion injury that occurs once blood supply has been restored. So again, for vascular injuries, the evaluation, if the pulses are present post-reduction and the ABI is less than 0.9, the patient requires additional uh, diagnostic workup. That can be performed with a duplex ultrasound study, which is highly sensitive and specific. More commonly now, a CT angiogram is typically performed. It's more accurate and cost-effective compared with a conventional arteriogram. For treatment of knee dislocations, the issue of repair of the uh, multiligamentous injury acutely or subacutely remains somewhat controversial. Typically, the ACL, the PCL, and the posterior lateral corner are repaired, and the medial collateral ligament injury is treated non-operatively. Uh, the most common sequelae of these dislocations, ironically, is a significant knee stiffness. Moving on now to talk about patellar fractures. Uh, Non-displaced patellar fractures can be treated non-operatively as well as those fractures that are minimally displaced to find as less than two millimeters of disruption of the patellar articular surface with an intact extensor mechanism. So you want to make certain that the patient can actively extend the knee. If these criteria exist and the patient can be treated with a hinged knee brace for four to six weeks as well as weight bearing is tolerated in the brace, typically performed with the brace locked in extension.
open reduction and internal fixation of patellar fractures is the treatment of choice for, for displaced patellar fractures, typically performed with an anterior tension band wiring technique. This technique, again, is a, is a form of dynamic uh, interfragmentary compression. As the knee is flexed, the, the tensile forces on the anterior surface of the patella are converted to compressive forces on the posterior or articular margin of the patella. It, the technique can be done using either K-wires or cannulated screws. It's important to remember that you should preserve as much of the patella as you can whenever possible. Open patellar fractures can be safely treated as closed fractures following soft tissue debridement. So in other words, immediate internal fixation is appropriate. And the most common complication following patellar fractures is symptomatic hardware. Partial patellectomy is the treatment of choice for extra-articular distal pole patellar fractures, remembering that approximately the distal 30% of the patella is extra-articular. Uh, the technique involves, um, for severely comminuted fractures, removing the comminuted pieces distally, preserving the largest pieces of the patella, and reattaching the patellar ligament anteriorly, not along the articular margin posteriorly, but anteriorly to prevent the phenomenon of patellar tilt. Moving on now to talk about tibial plateau fractures. Indications for non-operative management of tibial plateau fractures include the less than five millimeters of articular surface step, surface step off, as well as a stable knee joint uh, uh, with the knee in full extension. The technique would be a hinged knee brace, early range of motion of the knee, and delayed weight bearing, typically for eight weeks or so. Operative indications for tibial plateau fractures include articular depression greater than or equal to five millimeters, cond condylar widening greater than five millimeters, all bicondylar fractures, all fractures that involve both the medial and lateral plateau, as well as all medial plateau fractures, which typically represent much higher energy injuries. Uh, modern techniques include uh, limited incisions and, and pre-contoured implants that have uh, improved our results with treatment of tibial plateau fractures. They allow for indirect reduction of the articular surface, and the literature does support that no improvement has been shown in the results of tibial plateau fractures in using arthroscopic techniques to assess the adequacy of the articular reduction. Buttress plating is the treatment of choice for unicondylar uh, tibial plateau fractures. This technique typically allows for direct anatomical reduction of the typically the lateral or sometimes the medial tibial plateau fracture. It allows you to, to obtain rigid fixation. Again, it's appropriate for unicondylar fractures. The technique is performed using conventional implants. Uh, Pre-contoured plates are fine, but locking plates are not usually necessary, and locking screws are not appropriate for treatment of unicondylar fractures. It is important to respect the soft tissues when this technique is performed. And if you have a significant metaphyseal void, which can exist following the treatment of split depressed lateral plateau fractures, that metaphyseal void should be filled with either autograph or a bone graft substitute. If you're going to use a bone graft substitute, calcium phosphate products have been shown to have the highest compressive strength. Locked plating is appropriate for bicondylar tibial plateau fractures. As we uh, talked about with the distal femur, it allows the use of anatomically contoured plates to create a fixed angle construct. Again, there is a decreased incidence of soft tissue complications with use of the submuscular percutaneous techniques. A couple of teaching points about tibial, the locked plating of tibial plateau fractures. If you're using long implants, plates greater than 10 holes, you have to be aware of the potential for superficial perineal nerve injury. Um, the screws in the distal most portion of these longer plates should be inserted through an, inc an incision under direct visualization to protect the superficial perineal nerve. Also, in bicondylar fractures where there is a posterior medial plateau fragment present, those patients require a second posterior medial incision and dual plate fixation because placement of a lateral periarticular plate will not affect reduction of that posterior medial fragment. External fixation is appropriate for uh, bicondylar fractures as well. Um, you can do it using either a thin wire, uh, exclusively using thin wires, or with a hybrid technique with thin wires at the joint and half pins in the tibial shaft more distally. It's typically used with either limited open or percutaneous fixation of the articular surface. And then if you're using thin wires at the knee joint, remember that they need to be kept at least 14 millimeters from the joint surface due to the capsular reflection of the knee joint. 
Spanning external fixation is a useful treatment adjunct for certain tibial plateau fractures, typically as a means of temporarily stabilizing complex fractures as a bridge to definitive internal fixation. With the spanning external fixer across the knee joint, you can restore length, you can restore angular alignment as well as rotational alignment, and you can also indirectly affect joint reduction through the principle of ligament ataxis. And again, the ideal uh, indication for this is in a bicondylar fracture with significant shortening and or joint subluxation. Place an, a spanning external fixer to those patients acutely, restore the gross alignment of the limb, and then come back and do the definitive treatment once the soft tissue condition will allow. So again, the indications for spanning X-fix include significant associated soft tissue injury, significant fracture comminution, joint, joint subluxation or dislocation, and in a damage control situation. Outcomes of tibial plateau fractures. Outcomes are dictated by the fracture pattern as well as the severity of the soft tissue injury. It's critical to restore the joint stability and the mechanical axis of the limb. You should be aware that the literature shows that older patients have worse outcomes in lower energy fractures, and all tibial plateau fractures are associated with an increased risk of post-traumatic arthrosis, which may not present for five to seven years. Now, moving on further down the limb to talk about tibial shaft fractures, closed treatment is appropriate for low energy tibial shaft fractures. The technique is to use a long leg cast with early conversion, typically within four to six weeks to a functional brace. If you have an acceptable alignment and can maintain that alignment, then this technique has a very high success rate. Acceptable alignment for closed treatment includes coronal plane angulation less than five degrees, sagittal plane angulation less than 10 degrees, you need to have at least 50% cortical apposition, less than one centimeter of shortening, and the rotational alignment needs to be accurate within 10 degrees. Intermedullary nailing has become the treatment of choice for high energy unstable tibial shaft fractures. Compared to close treatment, nailing is associated with decreased time to union as well as increased union rate. Just as with femoral shaft fractures, tibial nails should be statically locked in other words, locked both proximally and distally for rotational stability. There is a risk of rotational malalignment in distal third tibial shaft fractures with standard uh, uh, tibial nailing. And in comparing the results of ream to unream nailing, it, reaming has been associated with increased rates of union, decreased time to union, as well as decreased incidence of hardware failure. Now, proximal third tibial shaft fractures deserve special mention. There is a significant high incidence of valgus and procurvatum malalignment in treatment of these fractures with an intermedullary nail. The technique of insertion of the nail is critically important. You want to have the starting point in line with the lateral eminence on the coronal plane image and parallel to the anterior cortex on the sagittal plane image. Other useful treatment adjuncts that can control the alignment of these fractures include unicortical plating, placement of blocking screws, where you place screws where you do not want the nail to go. You can also use oblique proximal locking screws, and most recently, a semi-extended or super patellar nailing technique has been advocated where you can greatly uh, control, in improved manner, control the alignment of these proximal third fractures with the semi-extended positioning. Open tibial shaft fractures are important. Uh, they have uh, often devastating consequences. The most important uh, treatment uh, point in the treatment of open tibial shaft fractures is early administration of IV antibiotics. An urgent and thorough surgical debridement is also critically important. During the debridement, it's necessary to remove all devitalized tissue, including uh, ischemic or devitalized bone if necessary, and be aware that uh, improved results have been reported with early soft tissue coverage. Now, the issue for treatment of open fractures with an external fixator versus an IM nail, comparing these two treatment techniques, there's no difference in the rate of infection or the time to union. However, intermedullary nailing has been shown to be superior in the sense that it is associated with decreased risk of malalignment, decreased need for secondary surgeries, and shorter time for the patient to return to weight bearing. The issue of, uh, for open fractures of ream versus unream nailing remains somewhat controversial. Uh, the most recent literature has suggested that there does not appear to be any deleterious effect of reaming on fracture healing. In other words, no increased risk of infection or non-union rates. The SPRINT study, a large multi-center prospective study performed by the Orthopedic Trauma Association in 2008, showed no difference in the results of ream versus unream. There is a, a tendency for decreased hardware failure using the ream technique.
open fractures and limb salvage. Uh, unfortunately, there's no current scoring system that we can use to determine whether a mangled extremity such as this one should be salvaged or amputation should be performed. The LEAP study, another important multicenter prospective trial performed in orthopedic trauma, showed similar functional outcomes for amputated and reconstructed patients. We do know that there are relative indications. Again, these are relative, not absolute indications for amputation, and those include warm ischemia greater than six hours, severe muscle damage, or severe ipsilateral trauma to the foot. Compartment syndromes are very important to remember when you're talking about tibial shaft fractures. With all tibial shaft fractures, the incidence is up to 9%. You can and will see a compartment syndrome with both closed and open fractures. And the important thing to remember with, compart with compartment syndrome is that a high index of clinical suspicion is critical based on your understanding of the mechanism of injury as, where, as well as serial examinations of the patient. Pain with passive stretch of the extremity distally is said to be the most sensitive clinical finding and the most sensitive absolute indicator is the delta P, which is the difference between the intercompartmental pressure and the patient's diastolic blood pressure. If the delta P is less than 30, the patient should be considered to have a compartment syndrome. Uh, one caveat about compartment pressure measurement is that it has been demonstrated that there is considerable inter-observer variability in compartment pressure measurement again, making, uh, highlighting the importance of compartment syndrome being a clinical diagnosis. Once compartment syndrome is diagnosed or suspected, then the only treatment, of course, is emergent fasciotomies. With fasciotomies of the lower leg, the dual incision technique still is the preferred approach. With a medial incision, you can release the superficial and deep posterior compartments. With a lateral incision, you can release the anterior and the lateral compartments. There is a single incision technique that has been described in the literature. However, that technique has not been associated with any in decrease in complication rates or reoperation rates. Moving further down the extremity now, we'll talk about tibial plafond fractures. Tibial plafond fractures almost always are the result of significant high energy trauma with axial compression to the ankle and the distal aspect of the lower leg. Articular impaction and comminution are the rule with these injuries as well as severe associated soft tissue injury. These fractures typically have metaphyseal bone loss excuse me, the fibula is fractured approximately 75% of the time and associated musculoskeletal injuries are quite common, again, due to the high energy nature of these injuries. And these injuries, unfortunately, have a notoriously poor prognosis and complications are common. The treatment of tibial plafond fractures, surgery is indicated for fractures in which the articular surface of the distal tibia is displaced more than two millimeters. The important treatment point for tibial plafond fractures to remember is that a staged protocol is appropriate. The patient should be treated immediately or urgently with bridging external fixation, placement of an external fixator across the ankle joint, keeping the external fixation pins well out of the zone of soft tissue injury. The fibula may or may not be plated acutely to restore length of the limb. And then the definitive fracture treatment is performed once the soft tissue condition can, will allow, and that's usually at a 10 to 21 days post-injury. So you may have to wait a significant period of time before taking these patients for definitive fixation of the articular surface injury. When it's time to fix the joint, that can be done with a limited uh, internal fixation technique with small incisions where you leave the expanding fixator in place versus taking the fixator off and performing plate stabilization of the distal tibia. When making multiple incisions around the ankle joint, it's important to remember to keep seven centimeter skin bridges to preserve the vascularity of the skin flaps. Complications of tibial plafond fractures, again, are quite common. Wound slough can be seen in up to 10% of cases. Deep infection in up to a third of cases in the literature. Varus malunions are common, particularly if the fibula is not plated. You can have a non-union at the, at the metadiphyseal junction distally due, to, again, to the issue of metaphyseal bone loss. And even with successful treatment, these patients often go on to develop significant post-traumatic arthrosis and stiffness. And again, even with what the clinician would consider to be successful treatment, these patients often have significant long-term phys uh, physical functional impairments, as can be measured with an SF36. Patient socioeconomic factors are predictive of the clinical outcome as well.
Now, talking about ankle fractures, medial malleolar fractures, close treatment is appropriate for transverse medial malleolar fractures below the level of the fond, as well as avulsion fractures involving the tip of the malleolus. The patient typically can be managed with a short leg walking cast or a cast boot with weight bearing as tolerated. Operative indica indications for medial malleolar fractures are, include the displaced fractures at or above the level of the fond. Um, two parallel cancellous lag screws typically are placed. If you have an at-risk fracture, such as a patient with known osteoporosis or diabetes, then full-threaded bicortical screws have been shown to be associated with improved results. And if you have a vertically oriented, a shear type fracture of the medial malleolus, then screws perpendicular to the shaft or plate fixation of the medial malleolus should be considered. Lateral malleolar fractures, remember that the goal of treatment is anatomical reduction of the talus within the ankle mortise. So any displacement of the talus laterally within the mortise is an indication for surgical reduction of fixation. If you're concerned about the competency of the deltoid ligament with a so-called functional biomalleolar fracture, an external rotation stress x-ray is important to obtain to assess the stability medially. And if the ankle mortise is intact, then up to three millimeters of lateral malleolar displacement can be well tolerated with closed treatment. Bimalleolar fractures, if there is any lateral tailor displacement, then ORIF is indicated. For the fibula, typically one or more lag screws is placed as well as a neutralization plate. The plate, uh, the preferred plate position is lateral due to the fact that this position is associated with decreased tendon ir irritation. The so-called anti-glide plate or the posterior lateral plate thus is more biomechanically sound, however, it is associated with significant risk of injury to the peroneus brevis tendon. For the medial malleolar fracture and bimalleolar fractures, again, cancellous lag screws or tension band wiring is typically performed. If you have a functional bimalleolar fracture, there is no improvement in the results with repair of the deltoid ligament medially. And be, with ankle fractures, beware of the significantly in, increased risk of complications in diabetics and smokers. Trimalleolar fractures, when do you fix the posterior malleolar fragment? Well, if it involves more than 25% of the articular surface or there is more than two millimeters of step off, the posterior malleolus should be fixed. Typically, that can be done by accessing the posterior malleolus through your lateral incision. And the technique usually is with an anterior posterior, one or more anterior to posteriorly oriented screws following reduction of the posterior malleolar fragment. Now, syndesmotic disruption of, is an important concept in ankle fractures. Uh, the literature supports that an unstable ankle syndesmosis is quite commonly iatrogenically malreduced in up to 50% of the cases. Translational malreduction is the most common, either in the anterior, either displacing the distal fibula anteriorly or posteriorly. You can also have rotational malreduction as well as possible overcompression of the syndesmosis. Anatomical reconstruction of the fibula, restoration of fibular length, and accurate positioning within the incisura of the distal tibia are critical. X-rays of the contralateral ankle can be helpful to assess the reduction of the lateral malleolar fractures. And interoperatively, you can do a manual stress examination, which again is external, rot external rotation of the talus within the ankle mortise. You're looking for the tibiofibular overlap, indicated by A here, which should be greater than six millimeters, as well as the tibiofibular clear space, which should be less than six millimeters. You can also do a cotton test, which is where you directly laterally translate the reduced distal fibula. If the ankle opens up medially or the syndesmosis widens, that should be considered a diagnostic of syndesmotic injury. Now, when the fracture of the distal fibula is within 4.5 centimeters of the plafond of the distal tibia, syndesmotic fixation is not typically required. When fixation is required, be aware that the clamp and screw positioning are critical. The so-called zero angle, as indicated on the diagram at the top right, is appropriate. The technique of syndesmosis fixation, you can use a single cortical screw, typically a place through the lateral malleolar plate, two to four centimeters above the joint. You can use a three five or a four five screw. You can go three cortices or four cortices, but you should not use a lag screw to avoid over compression. The issue of sc screw removal remains somewhat controversial. There is a, about a 30% risk of breakage of the syndesmosis screw if the screw is left in place once the patient resumes weight bearing. If you are going to take the screw out, it should not be done earlier than three months postoperatively.
Taylor process fractures, uh, lateral process fractures are the most common, much more common than posterior Taylor process fractures. And the importance of lateral process fractures is that they, have, that they are often missed. The typical clinical presentation is a patient that comes into the office or the emergency department six to eight weeks following a so-called twisting injury to the ankle with, an, so, with a diagnosis of an ankle sprain that's failing to resolve clinically. If the Taylor process fracture is non-displaced, the patient should be treated with a short leg cast and non-weight bearing for approximately six weeks. If the fracture is significantly displaced, then ORF should be performed for large fracture fragments or excision should be performed of smaller fragments. Taylor neck fractures. Uh, it's important to remember that the talus is covered over 70% of its surface by cartilage. The extensor digitorum brevis is the only muscle that attaches to the talus, and consequently, the talus has a very tenuous blood supply. The Hawkins classification system, again, has diagnostic and therapeutic significance. A type 1 fracture is a non-displaced fracture. A type 2 is a displaced fracture involving the subtalar joint. A type 3 is a displaced fracture involving both the subtalar as well as the tibiotalar joints. And a type 4 is a completely displaced fracture where there is involvement of the subtalar, tibiotalar, and talonavicular articulations. Now, displaced tailor neck fractures do require open reduction and internal fixation. This is felt to be a light of day fracture. In other words, so it was formerly felt that these fractures should be addressed uh, emergently to try to restore blood supply to the talus. We now know that these fractures are best managed when you have your best resources available. And the most important principle is to obtain an anatomical reduction. These fractures typically will have significant comminution dorsally and medially. Therefore, a dual incision technique is recommended with a sinus tarsi approach, as well as a second uh, medial incision to address the dorsal medial comminution. Varus malunion is said to be the most common preventable complication of tailor neck fractures. Non-displaced uh, Hawkins 1 fractures uh, can be managed effectively with two 4.0 millimeter screws placed in a posterior to anterior orientation. This is the strongest construct, whereas displaced fractures, Hawkins 2, 3, and 4 injuries, are typically treated with an ORIF with crossed screws placed in an anterior to posterior orientation. Uh, again, titanium screws are recommended to allow for possible postoperative MRI scanning. Uh, the postoperative treatment of Taylor neck fractures, non-weight bearing for eight weeks. A, remember that a Hawkins sign is a positive prognostic indicator. It's a subchondral lucency on the mortise or AP x-ray, typically seen at six to eight weeks post-injury. If the, that subchondral lucency is seen, it means that the bone is undergoing successful remodeling, which indicates that it has intact blood supply. So that is a positive prognostic sign. The risk of osteonecrosis with tailor neck fractures increases exponentially as you go from a Hawkins 1 to a Hawkins 4 with virtually a 90 to 100 percent risk of osteonecrosis in Hawkins 4 injuries. Subtalar arthritis is the most common overall complication in tailor neck fractures. Subtalar dislocations are high energy, 25 percent of them are open, medial much more common than lateral. The treatment is with closed reduction and a short leg cast for four to six weeks. If you have an irreducible medial dislocation, you should consider that, uh, that uh, a fracture of the head of the talus may be uh, at the uh, factor involved, as well as possible interposition of the extensor digitorum brevis tendon. If you have an irreducible lateral dislocation, typically that's due to interposition of either the posterior tib or the FHL tendons. Subtalar arthrosis is quite common with subtalar dislocations. Moving on now to the hind foot, uh, calcaneal fractures, non-operative treatment is appropriate for non-displaced Sanders 1 articular fractures, as well as for extra articular fractures, which represent about 25% of all calcaneal fractures. You put them in a splint or a cast boot and you want to get them moving the ankle and hind foot early. Uh, one type of fracture deserving special mention is the so-called tongue type or tuberosity fracture. Immediate closed reduction and fixation is indicated for those fractures due to the significant risk of posterior ankle and hind foot skin necrosis if that displaced tuberosity fragment is not reduced. The Sanders classification of calcaneal fractures is based on the number of fracture fragments in the posterior facet. This is a Sanders 3 fracture. The primary fracture line, remember, runs from anterolateral to posterior medial. You have the so-called constant sustentacular fragment, which under which the FHL tendon runs, and ORF is indicated for Sanders 2 and 3 fractures. Primary subtalar arthrodesis should be considered for severely comminuted Sanders 4 fractures.
The goals of surgical treatment are to restore the anatomy of the calcaneus, correct the shortening and varus malalignment of the tuberosity, and reduce the posterior facet. Surgery is typically delayed for 10 to 14 days until the soft tissue condition will allow. You look for the so-called wrinkle sign. The most common surgical technique is using the lateral extensile incision, keeping the flaps full thickness with use of low profile lateral implants. More recently, less invasive techniques have been advocated, such as the limited sinus tarsi incision. These allow for percutaneous fixation, as well as possible arthroscopic assisted reduction of fixation. These techniques have been shown to have lower soft tissue complication rates and equivalent clinical and radiographic outcomes. Postoperatively, calcaneal fractures are treated with early range of motion, protected weight bearing for a period of 10 to 12 weeks. There is a significantly in increased risk of complications in diabetics and smokers. Other factors associated with poor outcome include older patients, male sex, obesity, manual laborers, as well as workers' compensation injuries. Finally, now I have to talk about midfoot injuries. List frank uh, fracture dislocations typically occur with axial load on a plantar flex foot. Subtle list frank injuries can be missed. If you suspect that the patient has a list frank injury and the plane films are negative, then standing weight bearing x rays are indicated. The list frank ligament itself runs from the plantar base of the second metatarsal to the medial cuneiform. If a, if a patient has a displaced tarsal metatarsal joint injury, then ORF is indicated with anatomical reduction typically performed through one or two dorsal incisions. Screws are most commonly used for the medial column and K-wires for the lateral column of the foot. If you have an acute pure ligamentous list frank injury without any associated fractures, then open reduction in primary arthrodesis is the treatment of choice. Postoperatively, the patients are kept on protected weight bearing status for eight to 10 weeks. Early range of motion of the midfoot is appropriate. Screws should be taken out at about three to four months postoperatively to prevent breakage. Um, these uh, fractures have a bad prognosis with altered gait and post-traumatic arthrosis quite common, and they can often be the source of significant long-term disability and pain. Metatarsal fractures, operative indications uh, are open fractures, border metatarsal fractures involving the first or the fifth metatarsal, as well as patients with multiple metatarsal fractures. The Jones fracture uh, of the fifth metatarsal at the proximal met metadiaphyseal junction does have a high incidence of nonunion. This is a watershed area from a vascular standpoint. Conservative treatment of Jones fracture is non-weight bearing in a short leg cast for six to eight weeks. If you have a high functioning patient, then percutaneous Intramedullary screw fixation has been shown to be associated with faster healing and recovery of function. Thank you very much, and I wish you all good luck.